Hello and welcome to another webcast from your friends at Accounting Web. I'm Tom Herbert, business editor on the site. Thank you for tuning in. And thank you also to our sponsors at Sage. Uh, for any information about uh, self-assessment season, visit their website. It's fair to say that 2016 has been quite a tumultuous year. It started with David Cameron and George Osborne running the country. Donald Trump was still a bit of a novelty candidate in the US election and I still had a full head of hair. But uh, while many professions and people are gearing down for the Christmas break, many accounting firms are uh, just gearing up for self-assessment season 2017. To cover some of the uh, thornier issues of tax around this self-assessment season, I'm joined by two tax titans on the accounting web sofa. Uh, many of you will be familiar with Rebecca Bennyworth, uh, particularly if you tuned in to uh, some of Accounting Web's webinars or the Sage Self-Assessment Helpline in recent years. Um, Rebecca is a practitioner and head of HMRC's uh, Digital Advisory Group. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you, Tom. And joining Rebecca on the sofa, I think her uh, yellow sofa debut, in fact, is our star Irish signing, uh, Paula Tallon. Uh, she's the managing partner of Gabelle. Thank you for joining us, Paula. Thank you. Okay, just a bit of housekeeping first. Um, so things you need to know about the session. Um, we'll go to the slides. Uh, any technical issues we're having, all the sessions will be available on demand. So don't worry if you're having any technical issues your end or if we're having technical issues, uh, it will be available to download afterwards. If you have any technical questions about the broadcast, please email uh, on the screen there. Um, we will be, uh, you will be able to post questions to our audience. We'll be taking questions at the end and asking you to vote in polls. So any questions you have, uh, depending on your internet browser, uh, there's a chat window either to the side or at the bottom of the video. We will answer as many questions as we can. And if we miss any, then they will be answered as part of a post-event write-up on accountingweb.co.uk. We'll also be referring to a few documents uh, which you can access at the bottom of the page. Uh, you won't need to pause the video to access them. You'll be receiving a written write-up of today's session as part of registering for the event. And these uh, eight topics will be serialized uh, at the end of December and, and throughout January. So which topics are we going to be covering? Uh, we'll start off with Class 2 NICs, PPR, marriage allowance, buy to let, child benefit, valuation and goodwill, gift aid, and finishing off with payment on accounts. And then at the end, we'll be covering your uh, many questions, no doubt. So Class 2 NICs are a new issue for self-assessment season uh, this year. Rebecca, can you tell me any problems around this? Yes, Tom. Um, as you said, it's a new topic. So uh, previously, Class 2 has been paid um, directly by taxpayers um, during the year. Uh, and this year, for the first time, it crops up on the self-assessment return. Um, and that's actually provoking one or two little practical issues. So um, collected, as I say, via self-assessment for the first time this year. Um, and uh, there is a box on the return for it to go in. If you want to check what your client's liability is, uh, if you log on to the HMRC website and actually go to the particular client, you'll find there's a new thing on there that says information that will help with your self-assessment return. Uh, if you look there, it will actually show you the uh, class two liability. Now, there is a complication. If you've got clients who have got a full-time job and have paid the maximum class one national insurance contributions, normally they'll have had a deferral of class two uh, and not paid any. However, uh, technically, the way you calculate the maximum contributions set down in a statutory instrument, and there is actually a technical liability of around 70 odd pounds. That's not previously been followed up, so clients haven't paid it. But this year, with it coming within the self assessment um, structure, that's actually surfacing and um, causing a few problems. So, if your tax software calculates it, um, uh, it is right. Uh, if your tax software doesn't calculate, 
calculate it. HMRCs will, uh, and the clients will have to pay. And there's quite a few people scratching their heads and wondering where it came from. I'm afraid it is true. It is due, uh, and it's a bit frustrating. So watch out for that point on class two. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So something that's been of interest to people in this upcoming self-assessment season is PPR, and it's something that HMRC are looking into uh, more this year. Uh, Paula, would you be able to tell us a bit more about this? Um, principal private residence relief, it's always a great topic because what it does, it gives an exemption to taxpayers when they sell their main residence. Now, a lot of you practitioners out there will have had the question as to how long do I have to live in a property and can I claim my PPR relief. Now you need to make sure it is actually a main residence and that's something you will need to quiz your clients on. So they'll have to have physically moved in, they'll have to have acquired it with the intention of making it a main residence. And look out for things like garden developments. So if you have a disposal of a garden which is attached to a property and that property has been used as a main residence at that time, then the sale of the garden will qualify for PPR. However, if you get the sales the wrong way around and you sell the house and subsequently sell the garden, then you won't be entitled to PPR relief on the garden. And also I've put something on there on the Henke case. It's something for practitioners to watch out for. If you acquire the land and you build the property on the land, then you may have different acquisition dates, which can lead to a restriction in PPR. And of course, lastly, making sure PPR elections are put in where somebody has two or more residences available to them and you have got your two year deadline or two year period to do that. Now, watching out where you have got elections in place, it's making sure that if there is a change in combination, those old elections fall away. So when you're doing the tax return, make sure that any elections are revisited to see if you need to put in new elections and also make sure if there is any doubts over the PPR available to your client, the full disclosure is made on the white space of the tax return because this could save a headache in the longer term. Fantastic. Thank you, Paula. Marriage allowance has been around for a few years now and has been a bit of a thorn in the side for many practitioners around self-assessment season. Uh, Rebecca, is there anything that uh, we should be looking out for this year? Um, I, I, this is not a popular topic with practitioners because really you want to hide into nothing, Tom. It's, uh, it's a tricky area. It's a very small amount of money and you're unlikely to be able to bill your client for any uh, money that you've spent. So um, I think just be careful, watch out for it, be aware of it. Uh, let's just take you through a couple of the points to watch out for. Uh, both the claimant uh, of the extra relief and the surrenderer of personal allowances must both be uh, p basic rate taxpayers, both before and after the surrender has been made. Let's uh, have a look at the slide uh, at a couple of other practical points. If the claim uh, has been made in year, in a previous year, then this stands for all subsequent years, unless it no longer applies, for example, if the couple have um, been divorced or separated. Uh, so um, the in-year claim, you don't need to revisit if you want that to continue. Um, so that's one way of it working. The other way of it working, which is much more effective within the practice, is that the claim is made retrospectively and you uh, consider that claim when you're completing tax returns for the couple. Uh, so they must be married uh, throughout the tax year and they must still be married when the claim has been is made. So if you're claiming now, uh, but let's say they have actually got divorced since the end of the 15-16 tax year, uh, then actually no claim is possible. So that's one thing to watch out for. Um, I had a query quite recently, the spouse had actually died by the date of the claim, no claim is available, um, you have to still be married by the date of the claim. So look at that. It is, as I say, it's the most practical way of doing it because you know all the facts. You know what the income is, you know the position of the spouse. Um, so that's probably the easiest way to run it. So each year is a standalone claim. Now, HMRC has had some problems with their IT on this one, and I think it is now resolved. Um, agents should now be able to make claims on behalf of clients, um, so that should work. It's all done online. There are no forms or anything like that. Um, but in some cases, what we found is that instead of subtracting 
uh, the uh, amount foregone by the surrenderer. It's actually been added on on HMRC software. So do look quite carefully. Now, here, you may not act for the spouse. You may just act for one of the couple. So um, you might need to just give a bit of brief advice. What I've recommended to people is that maybe they have uh, a little postcard crib sheet for the other spouse that you don't act for so that you don't actually bring non-paying work into the office um, because that isn't really the way to do it. Uh, you've got to do it, haven't you, Paula? There's yeah. no way around it, but unfortunately, you're never going to make any money out of it. So uh, just one of those, as Tom said, thorn in the side. So yeah, bit of a tough one. Yeah, not a popular topic. Uh, accountants are definitely not wedded to their marriage allowance. So. No. Oh, very good. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, by to let has always been, uh, there's plenty going on, uh, self-assessment season around buy-to-let. Uh, Paula, have you got any developments on the buy-to-let scene? Right, buy-to-let are becoming a real headache for practitioners because they need to be on top of the changes coming in in order to advise their clients. Now, specifically on the tax returns they're dealing with now, they probably haven't got loads to do on that, but what they need to be aware of is when they're sending out those tax returns, they need to be letting clients know of the changes that are coming in. Now, if we turn to the slide, you'll see from 2017, there's going to be a restriction on interest relief. So instead of interest going against the rental costs, instead it's going to go in as a tax reducer. Now, this is going to be phased in. And on the face of it, if you are getting basic rate relief, a lot of practitioners think that there is no then change for basic rate taxpayers. However, because it's coming in as a tax reducer, that means some basic rate taxpayers could now end up as higher rate taxpayers. And if I could just take you through some examples of how it's going to work. So if we look at the first case here, so this is maybe your typical client. So Mr. X has a small buy to let property in order to top up his pension pot. And you'll see here, there's not going to be a massive change in the effective rate of tax. So he's just going up by 1%. However, if we look at our next example, and this is somebody who has a more substantial rental income. And you can see if we compare the situation from 2016-17 to what it's going to be in 2020-21, when the changes come in, we'll see the effective tax rate has gone from 29% up to 38%. So you may have clients that are financially making a loss or breaking even on their rental properties, but still have a tax liability. And if we go on to the next slide, we have another example in there, where you can see that the restrictions for somebody who has rents of say half a million. Now you won't have many clients in that situation, but there's always the odd one. And you can see they're going to go from 38% to 69%. Now, what your clients have probably be, been asking you is, can I incorporate my rental property? Now, on the following slide, I've put an example of how it's going to work if we take the client in the example before, and their effective tax rate can come down to 40% by incorporating. But to all you practitioners out there whose clients are coming to you saying, I have read in the paper, or I've read in a website, I can just incorporate, I can claim incorporation relief, and I don't pay any SDLT, in some cases, that is correct, but not in all cases. So if you have clients who want to incorporate their property portfolios, they need to be looked at on individual cases. You need to see whether or not you can claim on um, incorporation relief. And in order to do that, you need to have a business. And one property is unlikely to constitute a business. Also, if you have a partnership going into a company, you should be able to get around the SDLT, so you should have a 0% SDLT rate. However, if you have jointly held properties, then you won't fall into those rules and you will have SDLT. And of course, you'll be paying the additional 3% SDLT as well. So if your clients are looking for advice from you on incorporation, what I'd probably say to them is come back after the self-assessment season and sit them down and talk to them properly about what they can and cannot do. Fantastic. Tricky area. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Paula. And just a reminder to you out there, the slides will be available as part of the uh, event write-up. And if you have any questions on buy to let or any of the topics we have covered or will cover, then there's a cover it live box either to the side of this video screen or at the bottom. So feel free to ask away. Uh, so 
child benefit charge. Uh, it's been around for a while. Uh, Rebecca, can you uh, fill us on any changes this year? Tom, this is an unpopular subject, <laughs> um, both with uh, agents and with taxpayers. Uh, once again, and we've got a number of instances of this uh, in the tax system now, once again, it relies on knowing information about more than just your client in order uh, to complete the tax return. So let's go uh, through the basics. So you'll need to establish on a year on year basis what your client position is. Uh, are they um, in the household? And remember, this one applies to a household, not a married couple, or let's say not necessarily a married couple. So you need to look at the household. Uh, you need to find out whether any child benefit is being received into the household. Um, and then you need to look at the income of each uh, individual in the household, each, let's call them a parent, each parent um, to see who has the higher income. Now, if your income is very high, it's very uh, common now that you just make an election not to receive child benefit. And I'll go through precisely what that means in just a moment. If you have made the election not to receive child benefit, that will need to be revisited every year. So here are some things that your client is expecting you to do that your software doesn't do for you very easily um, and that requires a bit of thought. And it's, it's one of those things you're on a hiding to nothing, but you've just got to do uh, this in order to look after their tax. Now, watch out for the trap. Uh, so now let's let's go back onto this. What is the election not to receive and what is the difference when child benefit is not claimed? OK, let's have a, a, a little think about that. This has been in the newspapers quite recently. I saw a story uh, in The Times in the last few months about this, about mothers missing out on their state pension rights. So when um, a couple now uh, have a child, when they go to register the child, particularly if it's their first child, they'll be given the opportunity to claim child benefit. If they're a high earning couple, they may remember that there's something about not getting child benefit if you're high earning and they may decide not to claim the child benefit. Uh, that's the wrong answer, because if they don't make the claim, then the mum won't get the cover uh, that she normally gets from being a child benefit claimant that uh, protects her uh, state pension rights. So um, they need to claim and then they need to say, but don't give me the money. So it's a bit of a complicated one. So that's the election not to receive. You've actually claimed it, but you've also said, but don't give me the money because I'll only have to give it back to you at the end of the year. Back to the slide. Let's have a look at what else uh, you need to think about. So it is the member of the household who has the higher income uh, that actually ends up paying the high income child benefit charge. Quick reminder, it clicks in at 50,000 and you have a taper uh, process that takes you through to 60,000 when all of the child benefit becomes payable as effectively a tax charge. So it's at 60,000 you would elect not to receive child benefit. That would be the income of the higher earner. Now, um, one particular thing to watch out for that's a bit of a, a, a trap is that if the client has elected not to receive child benefit and their income falls, and let's say their income falls to 55,000, so they would actually be entitled to half of their child benefit, um, then what you'll need to do when you're completing the tax return, you'll see the reduction in income, then they need uh, to retrospectively reinstate the claim. Now the client can do this themselves, uh, but unfortunately the online form for actually reinstating your claim only applies going forward. So they'll need to contact HMRC separately to ask for the uh, claim to be reinstated for uh, the relevant tax year, 1516. Um, and then comes the complicated bit. And the complicated bit is that if you reinstate the claim, they will receive the full child benefit amount. Now, we've just identified they're entitled to half of it. So your client will receive a, a large payment, probably direct into the bank account. And then they will have a further tax liability to pay back half of it. What a complicated way of going around it. Um, there were a lot of people who said this wasn't the right way to do this. I was one of them and uh, I still think it's not the right way to do it. I think it's a bit of a nightmare. So um, again, it's something your client expects you to do as part of doing the tax return. It's out with the sort of normal run of the mill things, but you mustn't miss it. If a client's got five children under 16, it's a lot of money.
watch out for that, Tom. Fantastic. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, we've got a comment, in, a comment in from Guest on the question box. Uh, backing up what you were saying, Rebecca, don't forget to remind mothers to claim child benefit and opt out of payments to preserve NI credits for st state pension. Thank you, Guest. And you can add your voice in the comments box below. Now, valuation and goodwill is something that's been interesting, uh, interesting accountants around self-assessment season for a while now. Uh, Paula, would you be able to uh, talk us through uh, any sort of tips for 2017? Um, certainly, Tom. The, one of the reasons we've chosen this topic is there is an increased inquiry into the valuations placed on goodwill. And for those practitioners who've been involved in the incorporation of businesses or the transfer of goodwill, you will be familiar with this problem. So this is where a business has been transferred to a limited company and a valuation has been placed on the goodwill. And that valuation isn't agreed with HMRC in advance and it goes on to the tax return and the revenue may inquire into it. Now the difficulty is if you haven't been involved in the transaction and you're trying to deal with the tax return, well, how do you deal with the valuation aspects? Well, first of all, let's hope your client has a valuation. In a number of cases I've seen, there are no valuations in place. Someone has plucked a figure based on past profits and said, well, I think my business is worth X. Now, we all know the principles of valuation for tax purposes, willing buyer, willing seller, arm's length transactions. But what you're looking at is what value can you place on the business if it was independent third parties? And the multiples tend to vary whether you're looking at a profits basis or if you're looking at a consultancy kind of business, the revenue will generally go for a multiple of turnover. So it's making sure the valuation stacks up. It's also making sure that there's some paperwork to back up the transaction. You'd be surprised the number of people who've transferred substantial businesses into limited company and have absolutely no paperwork to back it up. As you're doing the tax return, that's the time to be asking the questions, putting together your file of evidence. Now, we hope your clients don't get an inquiry into the valuation, but if your clients do get an inquiry into the valuation, you want to be prepared for that inquiry and you want to be able to respond to HMRC's questions. And you also want to have a strategy for dealing with the shares valuation division. And also it's looking at, well, what rate of tax are you paying on the disposal of goodwill? So if you're looking at something that qualified for entrepreneur's relief, well, first of all, are you sure entrepreneur's relief is available? Did you have the transfer of a whole business or did you cease a business and then transfer the assets? Or did you simply transfer an asset? Now, if your client has simply transferred an asset, they may not be eligible for entrepreneur's relief. So it's checking that little point there as well. And, you know, it is a very, very complex area because it's subjective what a valuation is. And it truly, until somebody buys your client's business, none of us really know what that value is. We just have to use established principles and case law to place a value on the business. So a real headache area for practitioners, in particular this time of year, when they're really pressed to get tax returns out and this kind of thing lands on the desk as something that's already happened. Fantastic, thank you, Paula. As you say, complex stuff. And uh, you've heard a lot of goodwill from us for uh, <laughs> explaining it, so. Thank yeah. you. Uh, gift aid, we've had a couple of questions in on the Cover It Live box already around gift aid. Rebecca, could you talk us through some of the traps that uh, practitioners may fall into around uh, gift aid and the 2017 season? Yeah, Tom, um, gift aid, obviously very, very common, crops up all over the place. Um, let's just run through from the top some of the things to be aware of. Certainly, I think one of the useful aspects of gift aid is it's the only way that you can reduce, you can still reduce uh, the tax for 2015-16, right up until the date the tax return is submitted, provided it isn't submitted late. That's one of the ones to watch out for with clients who are a bit relaxed about the £100 fine. Um, you lose that option of carrying back gift aid payments from uh, the current year into 15-16. Uh, so look particularly at those clients with total income uh, between 100,000 and 121,200 
uh, the slide should say, a bit of uh, uh, mistyping there on my behalf. Um, they are, of course, paying uh, an effective rate of 60% because their personal allowance is being tapered. Um, and it may be that they um, they did or they have given regularly to charity. You could do a carry back of the gift aid payment. You might even have a pause after completing the tax return and say to your client, if you wanted to make any donations to charity, then now is a really good time to do it. We'll hold the tax return until you've made that payment evidence the payment and then put it on the tax return getting yourself a nice lot of tax relief uh, a really good way to give money to charity but to do so um, in a very tax efficient way also think about how you identify um, gift aid payments in the old days of course it was uh, donations to charity under deed of covenant there was a sort of formality about it um, so uh, how are you collecting data about gift aid payments? If people get sort of mugged in the street by the char charity collectors, is that uh, payment that they get um, persuaded to set up, monthly payment out of their bank account, is that on a business account? Is it an account you see or is it on a private account that you don't see and your client's forgotten to mention it to you? Also a big one, Paul and I were chatting about this earlier, quite a big one is, bag of clothes down to the Oxfam shop with your gift aid uh, sticker on it and you start getting emails. Um, I can't remember whether Oxfam does it by email, but certainly my local hospice charity sends me an email about once a quarter when they've sold a load of my old clothes and jigsaw puzzles and so on. Um, they state the value of the donation. Now, clients may not be tuned in um, to giving that to you and you're missing out uh, for a high rate taxpayer. You're missing out on your um, on your, on your extra tax relief and watch out for non-taxpayers um, particularly in the coming year so not so much on the return that you are just finishing but in the coming year the year that we're actually in we've got changes to the taxation of interest we've got people who've no longer got a tax liability and they need to know that they need to tell any charities they make donations to that they are no longer a taxpayer so they withdraw their gift aid statement otherwise they're going to have a tax bill can't do it retrospectively because the charity may already have claimed the tax relief. So that's something to really bear in mind as we go through this period where we've got some quite noticeable changes in the way uh, some income is taxed, particularly interest. Be aware of that. And one little story from me, uh, uh, just a, a very uh, interesting little story. I spoke to a chap, not a client, but I spoke to a chap uh, a few years ago. He'd uh, given up a big career in uh, London and decided to go into the ministry. As a result of going into the ministry, he had uh, for a period while he trained, no income at all. Uh, but he'd also decided to give a quarter of his wealth to charity. So um, he was uh, phoning up and asking for a bit of help uh, as to where to put things on his tax return. And of course, he had made a £40,000 donation to charity and had no income. So he had a nasty shock because having no income and given away a lot of money, he then had a big tax bill. So that's just a little sort of warning story for you. Um, so, yeah. yeah, hardly divine intervention. <laughs> I know. Okay, yeah. Really tough one, that one. <laughs> yeah. No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> Absolutely. So clients will be looking around this time of year to reduce their payments of, on accounts. Uh, Paula, would you be able to fill us in on some of the changes or what to look out for? Um, well, I was going to let Rebecca lead on this and then yeah, give you we'll, my thoughts. Yeah, we'll, um, I'll, I'll set down the sort of basics. So uh, there are payments on account due of 50% of the last year liability, 2015-16. Um, and that's due in respect of 1617 if the amount payable after uh, looking at tax that's been deducted either exceeds a thousand pounds or 20 percent of the total amount due for 1516 so that triggers off your payments on account now in law you can make a claim to reduce and many accountants will do this um, either using their software or through the hmrc website the form used to be sa303 so you can use that to lower reduce that liability However, what you've got to be careful of is that it's not a declaration that the income will reduce. It's a de declaration that the tax liability will reduce. And there have been some changes, haven't there, Paula? Yes, and in particular in relation to the changes on interest relief, this is going to change people's tax liability, even though their income remains unchanged. So it's watching out for that. And um, for people who are pushed into higher rate tax, who wouldn't have been in higher rate tax before, that's going to be an issue. But we were talking earlier about how 
practitioners come under a lot of pressure from clients when they get landed with the tax bill their first thought is well how can I reduce it and they go to the payments on account and it's making sure that if a client is asking you to assist in reducing the payments on account that you are happy that their tax liability has indeed gone down and that you have advised them correctly and maybe it's worth setting out in a letter to them if they're asking you to assist in reducing the payments on account saying you have asked me to reduce your payments on account and the reason for this is XYZ because you said your employment income has gone down well not your employment dividend income but that some income has gone down because what you don't want is this time next year that same client going well why did I reduce my payments on account why didn't you tell me at the time and again it's Ta tax practitioners at this time of year, they're very hard pressed under a lot of pressure from clients and no matter how well they've spaced out their tax return season, you know, clients will still deliver things at the last minute. Your most important clients will rock up with their things in a bag and say, well, you know, do you think you could have it done by the end of next week because I'm going away for three weeks? And it's very easy for things like payments on account to get left to one side. And it's making sure that you take the time now to deal with them bit unfair, everyone else is in the Christmas season and you're knee deep in tax returns, but that's the joys of being an accountant, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, particularly watch out this year for um, uh, the payment on account reduction, because of course you've got dividends coming into yeah. tax, basic rate dividends, never been a tax liability before. You're gonna have clients, um, you know, down the road next year with um, maybe some quite major tax liabilities yeah. and they've never paid tax before, oh my goodness. So they'll have next year, not only their tax for the, the uh, on the divvies, but their payments on account for the following year. Yeah, you, you need to take that into account. So if their income's gone down, you've got to bear in mind that that dividend tax is actually going to push the tax liability yeah. up, uh, and therefore not reduce payments on account. Now, if you do incorrectly reduce payments on account, what will happen is when the return is filed, those payments on account will get uplifted back up to where they were. Um, they won't go over the previous year's liability, but then there'll be interest charges on those. Now, technically, there is a penalty of up to 100% of the amount wrongly reduced. I've never seen a case appealing it, which probably means that penalty has never been levied, because if it was, people mm. would shout about it. But it's always there, and it's there, I think, for people who just gaily go around reducing those payments without doing the work. So Paula said, get some papers on file, get something down about what the basis of it was, and at least you'll protect your client from any penalties. And there's a first time for everything on penalties, and you don't want to be that first no. practitioner <laughs> who's trying to appeal <laughs> one of those case. penalties. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. So we've absolutely blasted through our topics here. Um, so we've still got a few minutes left. Uh, I'm going to go to the questions first of all, and perhaps if we have time after the questions, then uh, we'll have a little bit of a discussion about what lies ahead in the world of tax. Um, but we'll go to the questions first. Remember, there's still plenty of time to get your questions in to our two tax experts here. So anything around the self-assessment season, feel free to ask. Um, so we've had a comment here around marriage allowance. Uh, can someone who earns over 11,000 but less than 43,000 transfer their personal allowance to their partner if, for example, they pay tax at 7.5% and their partner suffers tax at 20%? Absolutely, they can, Tom. And um, that's one of the misleading things about HMRC's um, publicity on this. Now, to be fair, um, HMRC's publicity is mainly aimed at the lay taxpayer. So um, what they say is if you're not using all your personal allowance, you can transfer 10 percent of it. So 1100 to your spouse. Um, that's actually technically incorrect. You can transfer 10 percent of your personal allowance, provided you're not a higher rate taxpayer, um, just because you felt like it, just because you felt like giving HMRC a job or you felt kind. Um, However, as you say, as you rightly observe, it isn't just people whose income is below the personal allowance that can benefit from doing this. If they're paying a marginal rate of 7.5% on dividends and their partner is a 20% basic rate taxpayer, then that £1,100 is worth quite a bit more to your spouse. So yes, absolutely you can. It's one of the reasons why actually doing that election after the end of the year is quite useful because you can then double check you haven't got any high rate taxpayers. You can look at the marginal rates and say, oh yes, that's going to be the right way to do it. So yeah, that's a good tip. 
Fantastic. Uh, we've had another comment in. I'm not quite sure it's a question, more, more of a sort of statement you might wish to elaborate on. It's a so with the payment on account, you may have to repay the whole amount received in a retrospective child benefit claim. Exclamation mark. Uh, yes. Um, now, there is some debate. This child benefit thing is a nightmare, honestly. <laughs> I don't know whether you come across it a lot, Paul. I steer clear of it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it is a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, you may have got, if, if you think about this, you've got your payments on account set up. and They've had a, um, an election not to yeah. receive. So you've worked out the tax and then you've realised that their income's gone down. So they reinstate the child benefit claim. By now it's about end of February. Yeah. Uh, and then a whole hunk of money comes through. Um, and then, oh, <laughs> there's a tax payment yeah. for last year. And there was a bit of a sort of debate with HMRC about whether that tax payment would ha carry interest or penalties because you're late paying it. But... My view is that the, the actual tax payment, so going back to my example, the 50% you've got to pay HMRC back because they gave you too much mm -hmm. money. Um, I actually think that liability doesn't arise until you receive the child benefit repayment. And therefore, I don't, uh, yes, you could face paying it back, all of it back, or yeah. lots of it back, but I don't think there'll be any penalties and interest on it. But it's, yeah. Um, it's a minefield. I, yeah, I will say that recent governments haven't done anything to help us in um, in simplifying things. Fantastic. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, <clears throat> so earlier, uh, Paula gave a really good uh, um, presentation on um, buy to let properties. Uh, if you missed that, you can always uh, go back and watch our on demand version, which uh, will be available shortly after the uh, the end of this webinar. Uh, we'll also be serializing all eight topics. Uh, to, in, in individual articles on Accounting Web uh, over the end of December and all throughout January. Uh, we have had a question on buy-to-let properties. It uh, says, please, can you elaborate on SDLT on jointly owned buy-to-let properties? Oh, see, this, this is coming up the whole time, Tom. And indeed, I spoke to an accountant last night. He phoned me he'd been to a lecture and the lecturer had said, if you've jointly held property, you can get it into a company without an SDLT chart. And that's not strictly correct. So can I just go back and take you through the basics of how SDLT works on an incorporation of a property business? So what you're looking at is, if as an individual you have a property business and you transfer the properties to a limited company, well that's a connected party transaction market value rule and you pay SDLT at whatever the rates are on the transfer of the property. However, where you have a partnership, then the special rules on partnership applies and they're the sum of lower proportions. And when you work through the partnership rules, let's take an easy example. We've got a husband and wife owning properties in partnership together. If they transfer those properties to a limited company, the limited company is connected and when you do the sum of lower proportions, the percentage for SDLT comes out at 0%. So you have a 0% charge. However, if you have jointly held properties but they're not in a partnership, well then it's just a connected party transaction and the transfer is subject to SDLT. Now the difficulty is, is there is some muddy water around the difference between a partnership and jointly held properties. And you need to go out back to basic partnership principles. Two people are in partnership together if they set up in business in order to share profits and losses. So jointly held properties are not technically partnerships. So it's making sure you have a correct partnership structure if you want to go into a limited company. Now, Rebecca, you may have seen um, notes going around on this, but some of the recommendations is that, well, if you have a jointly held property, simply fire it into a partnership and then put your partnership into a limited company. Now, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And on this, there is specific anti-avoidance in SDLT. If you do something in order to get a reduced SDLT charge, then you don't get the benefit of the reduced SDLT charge. So if you have a husband and wife owning one property together, they suddenly dress it up as a partnership and throw it into a limited company, you don't qualify for your SDLT at the sum of lower proportions and that's 0%. And that's the bit that's causing confusion to practitioners. 
So this is where I'm saying, if you're going in, you go in carefully. And just one more point on that in relation to the partnerships is I've spoken about a husband and wife partnership. But if you have a partnership made up of a number of different people who are not related, well, the company may not be a connected party. So when you run through the sum of lower proportions, you may not get to 0% and it's working through the numbers. So the shortcutting it to say there's no SDLT on incorporations, you need to go back a few steps. It is complex, but you need to get it right for your clients. The other complication there, Paula, is historically, uh, if you've had um, a, a property partnership, yep. HMRC, say it's not a partnership because it's not trading and won't register it. Well, we've had that problem as well indeed, Rebecca, because what HMRC have said is you don't file a partnership return. So you need evidence that you have a partnership and yep. the kind of evidence I, that I would suggest is you have a partnership bank account. So all the rents are going in there. You prepare partnership accounts because that's quite fundamental. Of course, if you have a partnership agreement, brilliant. But I very seldom see husband and wife partnership agreements, but it's having evidence to support it. And of course, the bigger the portfolio, the more they work in it, the more you can genuinely see it's a business and a partnership. But yeah, yeah. it is difficult because revenue difficult. have refused to take in yeah. partnership returns for And I've got properties. actually got a client where not only are they a partnership, but they've actually created a trading name even though it's a property yep, business perfect they perfect. trade under a, a, a trading name um and it clearly is a partnership but um it's, that's brilliant evidence yeah, isn't yeah, it to yeah. do that and and just by fluke you know yeah. it's been very useful but it's it's just fluke and i was going to say just around llps because LLPs are a bit better because it's, the revenue can't really argue they're not a business because in order to establish an llp legally you must be carrying on a business yeah. So de facto, if you have an LLP, it does make it easier. Of course, be careful you're going to jump from your joint LLP and into company because you're still going to get caught. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, elaborating on that. So if a couple own more than one jointly held buy to let property, could this be classed as a partnership? Well, it depends. We've answered that from everything we've yeah. said, but you are trying to establish that a partnership exists between two people. My personal view is that one property owned jointly is highly unlikely to constitute a partnership. But where do you draw the line? Fair enough. OK, we've had one in from David Robinson around PPR. Uh, how can you guarantee that a new build has achieved PPR status before you could decide to move on, i.e., how long, documentation, etc. Uh, do you know, this is the classic question. Um, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. So it's about quality of residence. So what was the intention from the outset? So the new build is the classic, build in your back garden and move into it, and then sell it and claim PPR. And the question is whether or not it was ever intended that there was going to be a degree of permanence to your living in that property. and. In the last five years, we've had numerous tax cases on PPR, and some of those are very good cases. One of them which comes to mind is the person who moved into a two-bed flat and claimed it was a PPR, and the revenue said, but that two-bed flat would never have held, held your whole family. You couldn't have all lived there. So therefore, it was never intended to be permanent. So on a new build, I would say what you're looking at is clear intention that they intended to reside in it with a degree of permanence. Now. No one lives in a house forever, but it's a bit like, I suppose, getting married. You think you're doing it forever. You move into a house, you've got to think you're doing it forever. And it's being able to produce that it was intended, it was going to be permanent, that you factually move into the house. And as I said earlier, you move in your family as well. There was a case where somebody moved into a house and their daughter went to school 50 miles away and it was a day school. So clearly she couldn't have commuted from the house, so they forgot to move her with them. Um, moving in your possessions, changing your utility bills. And I always say to clients, keep photographs of things. You know, if you're somebody who entertains, well, photographs of barbecues, photographs of the grandchildren in the garden, anything that demonstrates you were using this house as a main residence and it was intended that it be permanent. So going back to your question on how long do you stay in a new build? Well, it's really going back to what was the intention from the outset? Can they demonstrate that intention? And was there a change in circumstances for them to sell the property? Maybe it was too modern. Maybe they didn't want it and wanted to move back to a cottage. I don't know. So it's getting behind what the client's intentions were. 
be quite a sort of lucrative side industry, sort of dressing a house and taking pictures of barbecues <laughs> and family parties and I, things. Do you know, I had a really good revenue investigation once on a property and they weren't convinced these people had lived in it as a main residence. And I had a great file of photographs and I started off taking the inspector through them and then I was taking, and this is her shoe collection and this is the specific built wardrobe. And they went, that's fine, thank you. We agree it was her PPR. Special uh, wardrobes for her shoes. <laughs> you, it's amazing what evidence you, you yeah. I mean, if you've got it, I, I had one with a client and we had a nightmare because they lived in it and then let it subsequently yeah. moved on to a larger property. And um, this had gone on years and years and years and if eventually they sold it. Well, of course, you're going back, you know, 10, 15 years. Yeah. Um, it, it turned out we were looking for parking permits. The particular local authority didn't have files going mm -hmm. back that far. Uh, we looked, tried to look at rates. Oh, no, it was when we had the poll tax. Yeah. All those oh, okay. records have been destroyed. Yeah. And do you know what landed it for us? Congratulations on the birth of your daughter. It, and she kept the card and the envelope. And the envelope. There you go. It took weeks and weeks and weeks, but we eventually we landed it. So it's just it's daft how things can. Yeah. yeah. So does it come down to a subjective judgment from an inspector? What's the? Well, it, it's it's not really subjective. Oh. It's more that you demonstrate there was that clear intention. Now it, there is a lot of case law there, but I think the increase in inquiries into it is because so many people have bought properties, developed them put a camp bed on the floor, slept there during the development works, then moved on and sold it. And a lot of the individuals who've been doing that have no other source of income. So their intention from the outset was always to sell the property. And that's how the revenue tend to bring these cases down because they say, well, what, what did you intend to live on? So you had this overdraft, you ran up doing it. How are you going to repay your overdraft? So you're living off the property capital. So that means, in fact, that it couldn't have been your PPR. Now, on these cases, what I find very interesting is the revenue just go for denying PPR and taxing it as a capital gain. In reality, income. these people are really trading and this should be income. And I've run the numbers a few times and one of the things I've thought about is, well, actually, if you do it as a trade and income, and of course the mortgage relief would become tax deductible. So actually, even though capital gains tax is lower, it's probably the revenue get a much larger gain than they would a trading profit. But do the figures on both if you have a client that you think or doesn't qualify for PP or is it a capital gain or is it a trading income? Mm. Fantastic. Uh, another uh, partnership question here. I'm going to... On the SELT. Duck, 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 <laughs> duck for cover here. But uh, yeah, so several properties, jointly owned, end of year essays, income split, bank account in joint names. Will this be considered a partnership? Um, it depends on how they're carrying on the business. But, you know, if they've prepared partnership accounts, they've had a partnership bank account, they've always run it as a partnership. It's about what evidence they can pull together. And as Rebecca said, the difficulty is the revenue haven't allowed these cases to file partnership returns. And that's what's caused the difficulty. But it's about having the evidence. And it, separate bank accounts always helps preparing uh, profit and loss, balance sheet and everything as a separate set of accounts rather than just a spreadsheet of rental incomes. You know, how would you prepare a trading company's accounts? You prepare the partnership business accounts in the same way. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for your questions. We've got about 10 minutes. So uh, I thought maybe I'd, uh, we've covered eight topics uh, pretty thoroughly. Uh, for the self coming self-assessment season. Is there anything else that uh, both of you uh, are getting queries on around the uh, forthcoming season? Um, God, I think well, um, I still get a lot around private company shares because if you have situations where shares have been transferred during the year to say somebody who's employed in the business, very often they've been transferred without any taught to the tax consequences. Now, if you're transferring shares as gifts between family members, then you've got all your holdover claims and everything that you need to do. But if, say, you have somebody who works really hard in the business and you want to give them 10% and your client is simply gifted that 10%, then you could be in a situation that the employee has tax that hasn't been accounted for. There's a, perhaps a Form 42 that hasn't been accounted for. There's the share valuation side of things as well. And, you know, we talked earlier about valuing things um, where you have connected party transactions and valuing shares is always a difficult one as well. So we, we, we see that quite a bit coming up. 
I suppose it, it's one of those sort of going cold moments as you're filling in the tax return and suddenly it dawns, yeah. oh crikey, oh crikey, they did this. They've mm -hmm. now just told me and this is a huge job. And yeah. Yeah, big job. You don't want that rocking up in December. And uh, I, I mentioned earlier about the PPR and getting that election in and just to reinforce, you know, this election which goes in where you have a change in combination of properties, a lot of people put their election in and think, well, I've done that. That's for my house in the country somewhere. And then over the years, they buy and sell and move different properties. And in their mind, they go, well, the house in the country is fine because I've got an election on that. But the minute you change your combination of residences, that election falls away. So you might think you have an election in 10 years ago, but I, the election might have fallen away eight years ago. And I had a case where that actually worked in our favour because the accountant had phoned up and they said they had a terrible problem because this election had been made on the property and actually they would have preferred it to be the one that factually was their main residence. And when we went back through it, I was, well, your election fell away six years ago. So actually, <laughs> you were in a brilliant position because they were selling one that clearly we could identify as the main residence. We had all the evidence. So the client was a very happy client then. Mm -hmm. But it's watching out for those kind of elections. Because if that election falls away, you go back to the facts, don't yeah. you? Look at how long they spent there mm -hmm. and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And the, the revenue are getting stricter on those elections going in as well. So you need to make sure they are actually signed by the taxpayer, not signed by the advisor because they won't be accepted. And while the revenue can't challenge the election you've made as to whether or not they can't say, well, it's not your main residence because it only has to be a residence. But what they're starting to challenge is whether the other one is in fact a residence and it's used as a residence by you. So it might be a residential property, but if you don't use it as a home of some sort or a holiday home or something, then they'll challenge the fact you actually have two residences. So it's becoming more and more of a tricky area. And that's where the white space on the tax return is your friend when you're dealing with this for clients. Um, I'm a firm believer in over disclosing these things rather than under disclosing them because I want to protect my clients in the best possible way and I will disclose any bit of doubt that's on um, a PPR claim or anything just to make sure that it's in there so the revenue when they or if they come back and they say well we didn't know well it's all in there in white space we described it exactly to you. Fantastic. Uh, Rebecca, what have your clients been asking you ahead of the uh, um, assessment season? It's, it's more about future stuff, really. Um, I mean, I'll pick up on that disclosure point that Paul has just made. Um, uh, disclosure is your friend because if HMRC missed something, then um, if you can show that you told them the relevant information. Um, I find that, that practically, and, and I deal with, with very small and unsophisticated clients, I think it's really wise to be very, very clear with your client um, about the things that have to go on the return and then the things that you are voluntarily putting on the yep, return, such definitely. as disclosures, um, because the idea is that the disclosure is there so that the inspector can open an inquiry. If they do open an inquiry and the client finds out that that was yeah. something you didn't need to say, um, then he's not going to be best pleased. But it's absolutely crucial to communicate with the client about these are the things we're going to tell the inspector. This is why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the client is absolutely clear. And obviously they should see that when they sign the return. But yeah. how many of them flip to the relevant page with the sticker mm -hmm. on? One year I tried not putting stickers on to show them where to sign. So they had to find the signature they box. They had to find the signature box. So they have to look through the return. Well, yeah. they all rang me up and said, <laughs> Where's the I sticker? don't know where to sign. So I've gone back to putting stickers on. But, you know, do they read the returns thoroughly? I doubt it. Well, but they should be. And there's been a load of tribunal cases where people have pleaded they didn't read their own return and the boyfriend had prepared the return. And the tribunal takes no sympathy at all because you are responsible for your own tax return. Yep. Um, your advisor is helping you, they're helping you prepare it, but ultimately you're the one signing off on it. And that's, of course, reasonable, uh, reasonable care, isn't yeah, it? If, yeah, you, exactly. if you haven't read the return and checked the return before your accountant submitted it, then you haven't exercised reasonable care. If there's something wrong, yep. penalty. Exactly. So, you difficulty. know, it's, it is, that's the problem is we get a signed return back, but we don't know how much they, you know, how much they've really read it. Mm. So. Yeah. yeah, I think I covered a, a case about a, 
it was a Derby County footballer who uh, I think his mother might have prepared the. Uh, <laughs> oh the my gosh! Yeah. Not the man uh, down the pub, but uh, yeah. No, no indeed. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, I don't think that was allowed. It, I was pleased to cover the case because it did allow me to put a sort of penalty pun in the, <laughs> oh, in the headline. So uh, there you go. Um, so David Robinson has been back on. Thank you, David. Um, around uh, he of the new build question from earlier. Okay. Yeah. Um, he says, "Do you have to actually make an election for PPR?" Or, or is it a point you make only if challenged? So this no, is the new no you, you, do, you don't elect for PPR. You factually, whichever is your main residence, that's the one you would claim. If you have two properties, then you you can make an election to decide which of them is to be treated as your PPR. If you don't make an election, factually, whichever was your PPR will be treated as your PPR. So if he's thinking of a new build, I'm just making up facts here, but I'm assuming he has a property already. He's planning on moving out of the property, letting that property out, and then he's going to move into the new build. So the question is whether the new build will qualify as a PPR. So when he disposes of it, he would claim PPR on the tax return on the basis he'd made a disposal. But the question is whether PPR is available, and that comes back to the quality of the residence and the degree of permanence and the intention from the outset. And you have to live in if you're talking about the election you actually have to live in them both yeah they're so both available to you owning yeah. one and letting it out that would never be your ppr yeah. so therefore you, as a question of fact as paula's example runs once he moved then that would become his ppr or could so, become yeah yeah it's capable got, of yeah, making yeah, a claim yeah. yeah okay great uh question from stephen m here thank you stephen can you backdate a child benefit claim if earnings have dropped? Uh, yes, you. Uh, now then, OK, let's get the wording right, Stephen. <laughs> if you have claimed child benefit and then elected not to receive it, you can retrospectively withdraw that election by up to two years. Um, but if you have never claimed... I don't think you can backdate a claim, can you? Because it's sort of social security I didn't law. Think you yeah, could. no, no, you can't backdate a claim. So if you've never claimed on the arrival of your baby, um, then um, no, you can't. But let's assume that it's in the position where you have claimed it, but you've also asked not to receive it. Yes, you can reinstate that retrospectively. But the point I made in um, in earlier on in the session was that um, if you do that the bit on the internet that lets you reinstate the claim only reinstates it from today. So you actually need to then contact them separately to reinstate it from the beginning of 15-16. So, yeah. This is so much additional work oh, for no. practitioners, isn't well, it? No money at all. Well, because a lot of clients will expect their tax return done on a fixed yeah. fee. Yeah. And it's getting more and more complex to do it with these fiddly bits and the couple's allowance and yeah. the child benefit. Put me in charge, I'll sort it all out. <laughs> Vote for Rebecca, everyone. Yeah. Fantastic. So we've literally got two minutes left. Um, would you mind, both of you, just passing on maybe a top tip for self-assessment season 2017? Paula, have you got um, do you know what I say? Keep calm and carry on. One of the things I love about being a tax practitioner is I have that time between Christmas and New Year where my clients don't bother me and I can catch up on everything. And I'm sure a lot of practitioners will share that. So to all of you out there who are working over the Christmas season, I will be there with you in spirit. <laughs> uh, I think my top tip is um, keep smiling. Yeah, <laughs> it's got you got to be. It. Gotta be. Yeah, try and see the the, the lighter side of life occasionally because it's a tough old. Period, it is. Isn't it? Yeah, and if you don't laugh, you'd cry. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, Rebecca Bennyworth, Paula Tallon. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you very much to our sponsors, Sage, for making this webinar happen. For more information about how Sage and their software can help you. Uh, uh, go through uh, the self-assessment season, um, visit their website. Um, I'm off to take my cold medication now, but uh, thank you very much for tuning in. And remember, this will be serialized over eight parts uh, throughout the end of January, uh, about the end of December and the beginning of January. Uh, so thank you very much for watching. On behalf of everyone at Accounting Web, goodbye.